Okay, welcome to lecture 14 uh, of digital design and computer architecture. Uh, we're going to continue covering pipelining in this lecture, which is a very fundamental concept as you've seen last time. And we're going to go into deeper issues that are interesting in pipelining. And these issues are interesting any high performance processor design today. We're going to talk about data flow and data forwarding and different ways of handling data dependencies. And hopefully we'll be done with pipelining and we'll try to start out of order execution tomorrow. But these are your readings. Uh, after this point, uh, your books are not going to be very sufficient after pipelining and somewhat pipelining issues also. Uh, so we're going to uh, read other things uh, as I discussed last time. So for out of order execution, there's a very short treatment at, in Harris and Harris, but I recommend this paper uh, that covers a lot of interesting topics that we're going to touch on today also. And this is our agenda. Clearly, we've covered single cycle, multi cycle. We started pipelining last week, uh, introduced the basic concepts, talk about different ways of handling data dependencies. We're going to go deeper today, basically. And tomorrow and next week, we're going to hopefully go introduce out of order execution and look at really interesting issues in out of order execution. So, let me quickly review uh, this slide a little bit. Basically, what we've done so far is we've built a single cycle MIPS processor and its control logic, which is single cycle, as you can see, which is very simple. And we asked the question, can we do better? And that led us to a multi-cycle MIPS processor, which is, as you can see over here, its control logic is more complicated, but now you can actually extend the design much better. And uh, we all talk about the shortcomings and upsides of this design uh, and how we can handle multi-cycle memory operations as well. And then we asked the question, can we do better? And the problem with the previous design was uh, limited concurrency. So we basically added that instruction level concurrency by trying to process uh, different pieces of different instructions in different pipeline stages. And of course, you needed to be more careful than this because you cannot really uh, put instructions. Uh, you, you need to basically provide enough hardware resources so that you can process different pieces of an instruction in different pipeline stages. You cannot ignore, basically you cannot just take a multi-cycle processor and uh, use the uh, let's say registers that you have in a multi-cycle processor to uh, generate a pipeline processor. So uh, it's more complicated than that. And we talked about pipeline data path and control in our last lecture. If you really want to jog your memory, review the last lecture, we talked about how to generate and propagate the control signals, for example. So our pipeline registers become, became larger, as you can see. And we needed to add more memories, uh, like instruction and data memories and different adders so that we could do different pieces of different instructions concurrently in the pipeline. So the control unit is actually the same as the single cycle processor. In fact, that's why we built the pipeline processor on top of the single cycle processor, but control is delayed to the proper pipeline stage. So these are all reviewed so far. And this was the basic idea of pipelining, basically. We, instead of having four cycles per instruction in these four independent add operations, we have four cycles per four instructions, meaning you can finish one instruction per cycle in the steady state. And of course, we said that life is not always this beautiful. Instructions are not always independent. And there are other issues in pipeline design. And we started talking about some of those issues. We talked about balancing work in pipeline stages. And we are going to talk more about keeping the pipeline correct, moving and full in the presence of events that disrupt the pipeline flow, like data dependencies, control dependencies. We talked about resource contention. We're not going to talk about that again. We'll talk about long latency multi-cycle operations a lot, especially next week, but in the context of out-of-order execution. We will hopefully talk about handling exceptions and interrupts today. What happens if something uh, external happens that requires the attention of the processor? What happens if, if an instruction faults? We're going to talk about that issue. And clearly, we're going to talk about minimizing stalls over the course of today and next week and later as well. How do we improve pipeline throughput essentially? And these were the major issues in pipeline design. Again, this is all review. And this is kind of where we stopped, although I'm going to include some slides that I've covered also. Basically, we were talking about data dependence handling uh, con concepts and implementation. Of course, just to jog your memory, what, are the, what is data dependence? It's essentially, the real data dependence is this flow dependence. A later instruction in program order requires a value of a prior instruction. Clearly, you have a data dependence problem over here, and you need to make sure that the later instruction correctly gets the data, right? And we said that anti and output dependencies are also dependencies, but they're not really true flow of data dependencies. In a sense, the, the instructions uh, do not need the data that's produced by a prior instruction, except they have a dependence on a name. 
which means that the register name. And this happens because you don't have enough registers in your ISA uh, to accommodate all uh, values that you need to use at a given time. As a result, uh, the compiler or the programmer allocates uh, the same register to different instructions that really have nothing to do with each other from a data flow perspective, right? But you need to be careful about how you handle these registers because uh, you're really reusing uh, the internal physical hardware structure to store the value in the second instruction, for example, into R1. And the earlier instruction is supposed to read from R1. So if you do something wrong, meaning if you write to the register before the earlier instruction reads from that register, then you actually break this dependence on a name and you get the wrong result. So even though these are not true dependencies, they need to be handled correctly uh, because they can lead to incorrect results if you don't uh, treat them correctly. But we will see that you can also eliminate these dependencies, anti and output, output dependencies using a concept uh, called register renaming that we will discuss hopefully toward the end of this lecture. And we will certainly cover it uh, tomorrow when we talk about out of order execution. Okay, I spent more time on this slide than needed, but this is, this, is the, this is a really important concept. We're going to deal a lot with flow dependencies, uh, but anti and output dependencies certainly exist, right? Well, somebody's asking, why is it called anti-dependence? Uh, that's just a terminology someone came up with. I don't like the name necessarily, but the reason I think it's called anti-dependence is if you look at flow dependence, uh, you write to R3 and you read from R3 uh, later. Here, you read from R1 and write to R1 later. So it's just the opposite of the flow dependence in a sense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not the great name. Output dependence is a better name, clearly. You're dependent on an output, right? Uh, OK. Um, OK, so this slide also uh, we covered, although I added one more thing over here. As opposed to having five fundamental ways of handling flow dependencies, I added one more thing, made it six, because the sixth one is really about out of order execution, which we will discuss. But basically, we said that anti and output dependencies are easier to handle in a pipeline, right to the destination, only in the last stage and in program order. And if you do that perfectly, carefully, then they don't cause a problem, basically. Uh, but flow dependencies are more interesting. And we talked about six fundamental ways of handling flow dependencies. Actually, we were in the middle of talking about six fundamental ways. Uh, and we said that the first three ways detect, uh, require detection. Actually, the fourth way that I added also det requires detection. Basically, you detect and stall or wait until the value is available in the register file. This is called stalling. This is the lowest performance, as we have seen. We'll talk, we'll talk more about this, and especially its implementation. Second thing is higher performance. You detect and forward or bypass the data to a dependent instruction. Basically, you wait only uh, for the amount you really, really need to wait. If the data value is present somewhere in the pipeline, you grab it. So to be able to do that, of course, you need to add forwarding or bypassing paths that, uh, that we will talk about in more detail today, but we talked about the concept. Third one is you detect and eliminate the data dependence at the software level, meaning uh, you don't need to, uh, no, there's no need for the hardware to detect the dependence. In fact, we talked about the MIPS acronym, right? M multi uh, microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. The idea is to for the compiler to schedule the instructions into the pipeline such that the hardware doesn't need to do anything in terms of data dependence detection because the compiler already guaranteed that uh, instructions uh, that are independent of each other are in the pipeline at any given time, uh, as we will see, or independent enough uh, so that they don't cause problems in the pipeline. Of course, uh, for this, the compiler needs to do a good scheduling of instructions. And if it cannot find good scheduling of instructions, meaning if it cannot find useful work uh, to schedule around such that the result of the uh, uh, program is semantically correct and the pipeline is also correct, then it will need to insert no operation, like no op instructions, which is not good. But again, uh, the compiler is scheduling the instructions and the hardware can be simple. Okay, So we're going to talk about this a little bit more today. And I'm going to also point you to some lectures because this is not going to be some topic that we're going to go into a lot more detail into because we don't have time in the semester. And the fourth one that I added is detecting. Again, it requires detection of the data defenses. But you move the dependent instructions out of the way so that you can execute independent instructions in an out of order manner. This is the key idea of out of order execution. And we're going to talk about this tomorrow. So I'm going to defer this one. And then we're going to talk about predicting and doing something else that's going to be the subject of this lecture, although we're not going to spend a lot of time on the prediction uh, part, but which is it's still fascinating, though. OK, so let's talk about this detecting and stalling. Uh, so I'm going to cover the first three uh, approaches, detect and stall, detect and forward, and detect and eliminate at the software level in somewhat uh, 
uh, in some order, basically. They're not going to be perfectly in the same order because I want to uh, introduce some concepts uh, in some way. But all of these require detection. Either the hardware detects the dependence or the software detects the dependence. And you either stall or forward the value or eliminate the, de uh, eliminate, uh, the dependence, meaning that eliminate the conditions that require stalling. Okay, so recall this, we, we also covered the slides. This was a five-stage pipeline, uh, which we are going to come to love uh, during this lecture also. And we looked at instruction I and J. And if instruction J is dependent, flow dependent, uh, when I say dependence from now on, it's going to be true dependence, data flow dependence, essentially. If instruction J is dependent on instruction I, then instruction I is going to write the results of the register file in the write back stage, but instruction J is already fetched, right? So what do you do? Basically, you need to make sure the pipeline doesn't move such that instruction J gets the correct value that is written by instruction I. So this clearly depends on when instruction I writes to the register file. If the instruction I writes to the register file at the end of a write back stage, then instruction J should go into the decode stage after that clock cycle, after the write back clock cycle of instruction I, which means that it needs to wait for three cycles in the decode stage. That's what this figure means over here, which means that the next instruction, instruction K, needs to wait in the fetch stage for three cycles. Okay. So this is also called a pipeline bubble. Basically, we've inserted three bubbles into the pipeline to make sure that instruction J uh, does not get the ro uh, wrong value. Right? Of course, this, uh, this is dependent on the pipeline design. Right? You remember, uh, in our pipeline design, we said that we are going to assume that an instruction writes to the register file in half of the clock cycle. So half of write back is spent on writing to the register file the result of instruction I. And the dependent instruction can read from the register file in the second half. So this is actually, if, if, if your pipeline works that way, then this what we've done in, in this picture is conservative, uh, meaning instruction J can move to the decode stage in T5, uh, meaning cycle five, because there is no problem. In half of T5, instruction I, uh, in the first half, instruction I writes to the register file. In the second half, instruction J reads from the register file. That way, you can reduce the two, three cycle bubble into two cycle bubble, <coughs> clearly. Okay. So, uh, of course, uh, bubble means somebody needs to detect the dependence, right? Uh, if the hardware needs to detect the dependence, hardware needs to figure out that instruction J is reading from a register that's, uh, that's going to be written by instruction I. And the hardware needs to add logic. Basically, the hardware designer needs to add logic such that the dependent instruction doesn't move in the pipeline. And some bubble gets inserted into the pipeline. Bubble is essentially a no-op in the pipeline, right? If you insert a bubble, meaning that you should not do any harm, essentially. It's a no-op, no operation. So hardware can insert these no-ops, as we will see. But as I said, the compiler or the programmer can insert these bubbles as well, right? Basically, all the compiler needs to do is add three bubbles, three no-operation instructions over here, or two, assuming uh, the optimization that we discussed, writing and reading from the register file in the same cycle in half clock cycles. Uh, so basically, the compiler needs to insert the no-ops in this case. Or the compiler needs to find independent instructions to fill the bubbles with that are not going to cause any problems like this, basically. That's also that's called the static instruction scheduling. The compiler looks into the code later and moves some instructions earlier uh, such that these bubbles are filled. Or the compiler looks earlier in the code and moves some instructions uh, earlier in the code into these bubble slots, if you will such that uh, the program semantics still get preserved. There, it's perfectly correct. And also, we don't have problems in the pipeline. So the compiler's task is now uh, twofold. It moves the instructions or inserts no ops, such that the program semantics are preserved completely as the programmer expects it. And there are no problems in the pipeline, meaning the pipeline doesn't uh, get wrong values or give wrong values to some instructions. OK, so we spent a lot of time on the slide, but I, I've essentially covered what I wanted to cover, I'm going to give you now examples uh, of uh, the, the approaches that I just mentioned. But this is a very important slide from this perspective. In fact, you can automate this, right? If, if you actually put the pipeline structure, formalize the pipeline structure, and give it to a compiler in a, in a formal way, uh, then the compiler can uh, know the uh, instructions. And uh, clearly, the compiler can figure out the data dependencies using data dependence analysis, and basically can figure out what uh, bubbles to insert, how many bubbles to insert, uh, uh, and uh, what instructions to move into those bubble slots or slots uh, that require independent instructions. Uh, 
uh, using that formalized pipeline structure. But that pipeline structure now needs to be visible to the compiler, and the compiler needs to do the instruction scheduling with that hardware information in mind. Of course, when I say compiler, clearly you can, you can uh, the assembly programmer can do this also, right? Uh, if, if a compiler can do it, assembly programmer or any programmer up the stack uh, can do it as well. OK, so basically, uh, we defined stall last time. I'm going to uh, define it again. Essentially, stall means that you make the dependent instruction wait until its source data value is available. If you have a hardware-based stall, you need to stop all upstream stages, meaning earlier instructions should not move in the pipeline because you don't want them to get the wrong value. And you need to drain all downstream stages, meaning that later instructions should move, should keep moving in the pipeline so that the pipeline gets drained and eventually the instructions write to the registers. Okay. So what happens in the bubbles? Basically, when you insert bubbles, they become no-ops. Uh, and we will see the logic for that. And this is the slide that shows the logic, essentially. So how do you implement stalling in the pipeline, uh, pipelines that we've discussed? Essentially, uh, uh, if, you, if you detect uh, this uh, dependence in, the, in this uh, decode stage, for example, and that's a normal way of detecting dependence. Remember, we talked about scoreboarding. I'm not going to talk about it again. There are multiple ways of detecting this dependence in hardware, as we discussed last time. But you need to make sure that the instruction here doesn't move, and the instruction here doesn't move. But this instruction here maybe depend on any of these instructions that are downstream. They should move. Okay. So basically, ensure that the stalled instruction and any earlier, uh, any uh, let's say uh, younger instructions uh, earlier in the pipeline instructions ensure that they stay in, the, in their stages. They don't move, which means that this is very easy to implement, actually. Disable the latching of the IFID register and disable the latching of the PC. Don't update it, because these are really what determines what happens in the stage. You just disable the latching, the stage doesn't move. Uh, but also, you need to ensure that later stages keep moving. OK, that's fine. This stage will move to this stage later on, and this, uh, this instruction will move to ne uh, the next stage later on. But because you stop the instruction in the decode stage, uh, what happens to the IDEX register in the next cycle? Essentially, you need to insert a bubble over there because this instruction is not supposed to go. What does inserting a bubble, bubble mean? Basically, you can make air, uh, all of the control signals uh, uh, such that they do no harm. That's one way. Uh, and that's a perfectly valid way of doing it. Essentially, you insert a no-op instruction. Or you insert, you have an invalid bit uh, associated with a register or a valid bit associated with a register uh, and set that bit, basically. Uh, this bit may be associated with each of the pipeline registers. And if, the pi if this bit is invalid, meaning uh, there is no real instruction in, the, uh, in this pipeline register, then all of the control signals are going to be gated with that valid bit. So if you set this uh, valid bit to zero, uh, that means that none of the control signals are going to do any harm in that stage. Of course, you need to design your logic to always take into account that valid bit, basically. So if you're writing to uh, data memory, for example, you should check whether the instruction in this execute memory latch uh, pipeline register is valid. Right? So that's one way of implementing uh, a no-op, if you will, in the pipeline. You set the valid bits, you add valid bits associated with each pipeline register. And set the valid bit to zero if the instruction is stalling. Uh, if the instruction in this stage is stalling, you set the valid bit to zero. And that valid bit, of course, gets propagated as well as uh, the pipeline moves. And uh, this valid bit is used to gate all of the control signals such that the control signals do no harm if the valid bit is zero. Right? And this is one way of implementing a bubble, for example. There are multiple other ways, as I discussed. Uh, you could zero out all of the control signals that do no harm. But valid bits are a very easy way of implementing this, actually. Uh, so usually they're used. OK, to stop the latching, you would enable signals, right? And, and they're not shown in the schematic. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, these schematics, unfortunately, in your books are uh, coming from different parts. They don't necessarily show all of the signals in the, latch, in the registers. But yes, you do need uh, an enable uh, signal uh, uh, to, uh, to essentially implement uh, stalling in the PC and IFID uh, pipeline registers. OK, OK, let me give you uh, the same example very quickly. So uh, this is our read after write data dependence example. Uh, so now we, we see some real code, as you can see. So this uh, add instructions writing to S0 and instructions reading from S0, as you can see. And this is add instructions writing to S0 in cycle 5. Uh, 
Uh, and next instructions, actually, all of the next instructions are reading from S0, as you can see. All of them are dependent on the add. So you can see that add writes to S0 in the first half of cycle five. If you do not implement stalling, and reads S0 on cycle three, obtaining the wrong value, and or reads uh, uh, S0 on cycle four, again, obtaining the wrong value. Now, only sub reads S0 in the second half of cycle five, getting the correct value. So basically, if you do not implement stalling in some way, this and and or will get the wrong value because pipeline keeps moving, right? But we already figured out that you need to implement that stalling. OK, then the question is, of course, how do you implement that stalling? Now, uh, you need to detect that an instruction is writing to SCO, and another instruction is going to be reading from SCO, right? And we discuss multiple methods of doing that. Uh, and subsequent instructions clearly read the correct value of the SCO. So clearly, in this particular pipeline design, you need to have two bubbles, right? Not three bubbles, because we are assuming uh, writing and reading from the register file in the same cycle, as you can see over here. But you do need to insert two bubbles, or you need to insert two stall cycles such that this end gets delayed until cycle five uh, and moves into the uh, basically, end, yeah, end gets delayed until cycle five. It stalls for two cycles, essentially. Of course, uh, this picture is uh, wrong only if the pipeline handles data depends incorrectly. So we're going to handle it correctly. Now, let me give you the, how the compiler could potentially handle this exact same dependence that I showed you. So this is the code add, end, or sub. You can see that the later three instructions are dependent on uh, the add. Now the compiler can figure this out. If, if, if someone formally describes a pipeline to the compiler or the assembly programmer, uh, then I can easily say, and, and someone says that, OK, hardware doesn't do any data dependence detection, so it's your responsibility to make sure this pipeline works correctly. The easiest way I would make sure this pipeline works correctly is by inserting no ops, two no ops after the add. That makes sure that end gets the correct value when it gets to the register file stage. Right? And I basically waste two uh, pipeline slots, if you will, uh, by inserting two no ops into the program. So clearly, this works. And you can convince yourself that it works. Basically, you need to insert enough no ops for the required result to be ready. The date dependent instruction, the flow dependent instruction, should read the result that's correct. And you need to be able to insert enough no ops for that. So now we imagine that you have a 10-stage pipeline or 20-stage pipeline. In fact, pipelines have been increasing over time. Uh, for example, uh, one of Intel Pentium 4 versions in 2004, uh, Prescott, for example, uh, at that time, the processors were in 90 nanometers. Where today, we're talking about almost 5 nanometer processors, right? Uh, at that time, it was 90 nanometers. But people wanted to increase the clock frequency a lot at that time. And that uh, processor had a 30-stage pipeline, 30 stages. Now imagine, the, could this be a good solution if you have 30 stages? Now, uh, you, your result may be produced uh, in stage 22. I'm just making it up. Uh, does it really make sense to uh, insert, let's say, 22 uh, no ops into your program just to make sure that uh, you get the correct value at, uh, by scheduling instructions at, at the compile time? And the answer is no, of course. Uh, in a longer pipeline, you, you need to actually really do hardware-based data dependence detection uh, to ensure that uh, you don't get uh, huge performance losses. Because if your pipeline is 30 stages, and if, if 22 instructions that you insert are no ops, then you're really wasting the throughput of your pipeline. In this case, also, you're wasting the throughput of your pipeline right? because of this data dependence. If there are no data dependencies, no problem. But once data uh, dependencies are happening, and if you're handling uh, it, uh, it through the compiler like this, you're wasting two cycles, as you can see. OK, so this is the naive way, of course, right? Whenever you see a data dependence, insert a no-op. And that fixes the problem clearly. But of course, we want to be higher performance and intelligent. Then the compiler has a choice, or the programmer has a choice, basically. Uh, the programmer can basically uh, say, or the compiler can say, oh, I'm going to look down further. Oh, maybe there is another instruction down here. Uh, and let's say um, uh, an a, a, and instruction. And it's not sourcing S0. And it's not sourcing any other instructions over here. Let's assume that. Basically, it's not dependent on add. So maybe I should take that instruction that's down here and move it into this first no op slot. Then there's no problem. Of course, you need to make sure that later instructions uh, don't, uh, this instruction, moving this instruction up into the no op slot doesn't cause a problem for these instructions that you reordered the later instruction earlier into. Right? So whenever you reorder instructions, you should respect the data dependencies 
Uh, and you should respect the name dependencies also carefully. OK, uh, so basically, that's the idea. Uh, th that's the second bullet over here. Uh, if possible, the compiler or the programmer can move independent usable instructions up in the code. So this is one example. This is saying up. But you could also imagine doing this from the top. You could take some instructions here earlier from the add and move it down. But whenever you're doing things like that, you need to be careful, right? Clearly, you cannot move an instruction that add is dependent on into the slot, right? So that doesn't make sense because that breaks the semantics of the pro program. And here, clearly, you cannot move an instruction that is dependent on and or or sub earlier into the no op slot. And clearly, you cannot move an instruction that's dependent on add earlier into no op because that uh, defeats the purpose because you want something independent of add, right? So basically, whenever you are moving instructions from uh, later in the code into these bubble slots, let's call them, or from earlier in the code into these bubble slots, such that you, you want to eliminate these bubble slots, you want to do useful work, keep the pipeline uh, executing useful work, the compiler or the programmer needs to be extra careful such that they do not violate data dependencies. And also, they do not cause other problems. Uh, because when you move this instruction uh, here, for example, you may cause some other problem, which may be that this end instruction sourcing S0 and S1, this instruction that you move from the top may be writing to S1. Right? Then you're back to square one again. You're not solving the problem. You really need to move an instruction here that's independent of the at, and that end is independent of, right? Uh, and probably or also, depending on, yeah, well, or may not be here. For this slot, or may not be. But for this slot, it, uh, and and or should be independent of that instruction. So OK, so hopefully I've given you the complexities of instruction scheduling uh, a little bit at compile time. And if you're doing it as a, as a programmer, you need to heed that also. But if you're doing it as a compiler, you need to write the compiler correctly, such that the compiler doesn't do any, make any mistakes. And this becomes even more hairy if you have control flow instructions. So right now, we don't have any control flow instructions over here, right? But if you have a branch somewhere, then moving an instruction after a branch becomes even more dangerous because the program may never get to that instruction, right? So if that's the case, then uh, the compiler-based instruction scheduling needs to be even smarter. It can move. This doesn't mean that the presence of a branch here, for example, doesn't mean that an independent instruction, an instruction, for example, here or here. So branch uh, takes two paths, right? A taken path, not taken path. And there are two possible instructions, two possible paths that you follow. Uh, the compiler, uh, today's compilers are quite smart, basically. You can actually move an independent instruction here. But if, the, if that independent instruction is not supposed to be executed because the branch doesn't go the way that independent instruction is supposed to be executed on, then you need to make sure that you do no harm. Meaning the compilers usually insert some code on the opposite path to undo the effects of the instruction that were moved into these slots. So now I'm getting more complicated. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm going into a little bit more detail. You don't need to perfectly understand all of these things in detail. You just need to have a good concept. But basically, if you have a control flow instruction, a branch, uh, especially a conditional branch, that complicates the problem. You can potentially move independent instructions after a, a conditional branch into these no-op slots, but you should make sure that you do no harm if that branch doesn't go the way uh, 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 such that that independent instruction is supposed to be executed. Same problem exists before the add. So in the sequential code over here, you may have a branch instruction right over here. Can you move an independent instruction earlier from the branch into this no-op slot? And the answer is yes, but you need to be ultra careful again. And if, uh, yeah. Exactly. I'm not going to go into the details of this because I'm going to point you to lectures that talk about instruction scheduling. So clearly, this is a very fascinating concept. Uh, and modern compilers actually do a lot of this. But modern compilers uh, usually do not uh, uh, have, to, uh, have to do it in the sense that almost all modern high-performance processors have stalling hardware, as we will discuss. Basically, they implement stalling and uh, such that uh, it's not only the compiler's responsibility to ensure that the pipeline works. OK. But we will later see some processors called VLIW, very long instruction work processors, where the philosophy is that the hardware doesn't do anything in terms of data dependence detection. It's only the function uh, or task of the compiler to do it. And that, uh, uh, that kind of processor has led to development of uh, many, many interesting techniques in compilers. And we will talk about that later on. Okay, 
So let's talk about data forwarding. We also talked about we also talked about data forwarding earlier. This is also called data bypassing. It's basically a step forward from stalling. And we've already seen the basic idea before. Basically, the idea is don't wait until the data gets written to the register file. Forward the result value of uh, a producer instruction to the dependent instruction as soon as the value is available. Right. So the value is available after the ALU output. Send it directly to the stage that this Instru uh, dependent instructions waiting for the value at. So remember data flow? Actually, this is the data flow principle. Data value supplied to de dependent instruction as soon as it's available, right? So instruction executes when all its operands are available. Data forwarding brings a pipeline closer to these data flow execution principles because you're really supplying the data directly to where the instruction is. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this example before. Add instruction, produce its value, in actually cycle three, right? The result is available at cycle three, it gets latched. So you can directly result, uh, you, you latch the result uh, in the pipeline register over here at the end of ALU uh, or the execute stage. And in the next cycle, you can directly send or bypass the value to the input of the ALU where AND will be executing uh, its, uh, with its operands. Basically, AND will take one of its operands from this latch, right? And the other operand will come from the latched value from the register file. So and will read the register file, get the wrong value, older value of S0, latch it. In the next cycle, it will figure out that a new value of S0 is written by add, and that will be forwarded. So there will be a multiplexer over here, mux, uh, and the control signals uh, for the data forwarding path will ensure that and will select the data value coming from uh, the output uh, of add uh, from essentially from this register over here, uh, if you think about it uh, that way, essentially the output of add uh, the next stages pipeline register and not from the stages pipeline register. So we will see this pass in, in, a, in a picture soon. So that forwarding pass enables and to execute without any delay. You don't need to stall anymore. You just need to provide the logic such that and gets the value of S0 not from the register file that it read, but from uh, the latched result of the ALU uh, by, uh, in, in, in the previous stage, essentially. Right? Or again, doesn't need to wait for S0 to be written to the register file. So, or for example, when it executes, when it, uh, when it reads the register file in cycle four, it reads S, S4 and S0, but S0 value is incorrect, right? Fine, no problem, right? In cycle five, the result of add is actually in this register, pipeline register, and gets forwarded to the second input of the ALU as well. You just need to provide the data forwarding detection logic, data dependent detection logic, which we discussed last time. We're going to discuss a little bit more. Basically, you need to check whether the, the instruction, the write back stage is actually writing to S0. And if that's the case, uh, writing to uh, the register that the instruction of the ALU stage is read, supposed to read from, if that is the case, you forward the value to the second input of the ALU over here to execute the OR. Okay. So by adding these forwarding paths that take the values directly to the ALU inputs, as we see over here, either the left input or right input, you need to actually provide both paths from both stages, both of these later stages into the inputs of the ALU. You need to provide the MUXs multiplexer so that you can select whether the instruction is supposed to use the register file output or a data value coming from this stage or data value coming from this stage because there might be instructions writing. Uh, the the, the pr producer instruction might be in any stage, right? Uh, and you need to do the exactly the same thing uh, for the second input of the ALU as well. Uh, and as we, we, we will see that uh, later on. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Okay, there's some question. I think let me try to handle that quickly. Uh, don't we get single cycle MA when forwarding data in terms of efficiency? I don't know what MA means. Uh, if you can clarify that, uh, maybe I'll answer it. Is it too complicated to forward uh, S0 for the, uh, for the OR operation from the location where it got forwarded to the end? Oh, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, basically, uh, uh, S, uh, this OR, uh, can it actually get the uh, data uh, from here directly? Uh, I mean, it's possible. It depends on the pipeline design. It can latch the value over here also. But uh, again, 
you will have to have this path anyway, because there are cases where this will happen. So this uh, providing this path uh, from uh, the data memory stage to the register file stage may be unnecessary, basically. But that's a good question. It really depends on their critical path uh, also. OK, single file uh, cycle MA when forwarding data. Uh, not necessarily, right? It's not uh, fully single cycle. But basically, you are reducing, uh, uh, certainly, you're reducing the impact of data dependencies, right? We're not, uh, instructions are still taking multiple cycles. Uh, but yes, you're reducing uh, the, uh, I think what you're getting at is, can we eliminate all of the data dependencies this way? And the answer will be no, as you will see soon. If you can eliminate all of the data dependencies this way, then you will get one cycle per instruction. You're right in terms of CPI. Uh, but uh, you, you, we will soon see that you cannot eliminate all the dependencies this way. OK, so let's look at the forwarding paths. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I already mentioned what is required. But you can see that the ALU result gets slashed and it gets forwarded to both possible inputs of the ALU, right? So this is the ALU result that was slashed by the previous instruction. Now it's in this stage. Now we just need to potentially move it to either source A or source B, OK? So we need to add new MUXs, multiplexers, to do data forwarding. Clearly, this may affect your critical path also. So there is a trade-off between cycles per instruction and uh, critical path clock cycle time, potentially. And you can see that the logic, this is called hazard unit. I don't like the word hazard, as I mentioned. It's essentially a data dependence uh, checking unit, I should say, data dependence detection unit. Essentially, this data dependence detection unit needs to check whether this instruction is writing to a register. And if the instruction that's written uh, if the register ID that's written by this register is equal to the register ID that is required by this instruction as part of source A, or uh, that is required by this instruction as part of source B, right? And then you need to do the same thing for the instruction that's writing over here. And then that needs to be also forwarded uh, from there, as we will see in a little bit. I don't, uh, actually, this is not shown uh, over, oh, it's, show, it's shown over here, actually. It's not highlighted, unfortunately. Basically, you can see that that result also can come from the right backstage, right? So the results can come from this instruction or this instruction for both of the source operands. And you need to basically detect where it's coming from and you need to actually provide the data path to actually forward the result. So, okay, uh, an instruction, uh, two instructions, both of the instructions might be writing to uh, the same register. Why not, right? It's possible. You could uh, perfectly have a program like that. In that case, you should get the value from the later instruction, meaning the instruction that's in the next pipeline stage, clearly, right? If both of these instructions are writing to S0, for example, and this instruction here is reading from S0, then you should really get the result of S0 from this instruction, because that's the instruction that's uh, the uh, youngest instruction that's writing to S0, clearly. OK, uh, so I've said a lot, but you can see the implementation of this hazard unit in your book. Uh, again, data dependence detection unit. But basically, now a lot of trade-offs potentially exist. You're, we're reducing. The stall clearly, we got rid of the stall, but we might potentially lengthen the critical path. If the critical path goes through the ALU, well, now we're adding more MUXs. And these are potentially bigger MUXs. Now, if your pipeline becomes deeper and deeper, let's imagine 10 stages so that you can increase your clock frequency, right? This MUX becomes wider, larger and larger, right? You may actually have seven inputs to this MUX. And this data dependence checking logic also becomes uh, uh, essentially. Uh, uh, bigger, if you will. OK, so essentially, we need to forward to execute stage from either memory stage or write back stage. Uh, and then I already answered this question. Why should we forward from either memory or write back stage? If that stage will write to a destination register and the destination register matches the source register, right? If both memory and write back stages contain matching destination registers, the memory stage should have priority because it contains the more recently executed instruction, as we also discussed. I'm not going to talk about this, but this essentially, in pseudocode, implements what I just said. And it basically sets the control signals for those MUXs, multiplexers. And this is also in your book. And you can easily, uh, you can do it in your sleep probably uh, after taking this course, uh, if not now. OK, so this is uh, to demonstrate that forwarding is not always possible. So this really depends on pipeline structure and instruction latencies. But forwarding normally should be completely sufficient to resolve data dependencies, as one of your uh, colleagues kind of hinted at. Normally, you should be able to forward, and you don't need to stall for data dependencies. But unfortunately, that's not always the case because of the pipeline structure. For example, if you look at this load word, this load word uh, loads the results at the end of the memory stage. Right Now, 
uh, but uh, this AND instruction is requiring that result. Now, uh, when load word is uh, here in the memory stage, you have the full cycle to access memory and the results available at the end of the cycle. Now, if you want to forward that in the same clock cycle to the ALU, you're going to lengthen the clock cycle, right? And make it almost twice, perhaps, right? Now, so in this case, the forwarding is not a good idea. It's certainly possible, but you will lengthen the clock cycle. So maybe the title is not perfectly correct in the sense that basically forwarding here goes against uh, the principles of, uh, let's say, uh, critical path design. Normally, you forward from a pipeline register, basically. That's a good principle design because you produce the value in the previous pipeline stage, latch the value, and then forward. Now, if you want to do that here, you cannot because the next instruction is, uh, wants the data in the ALU stage while the previous instruction is accessing memory and producing the data. Right? So there has to be a stall cycle that you insert after this load so that this end operation can get the value, dependent end operation can get the value. You can, if you had a forwarding path from here, you're violating the critical path principle. If you had a forwarding path from the last value of the memory stage, you're too late this instruction should not have moved into ALU because it didn't get the correct value. Right? So here you have to add a no op or you have to stall after the load. Basically, that's what to say. Basically, there are cases when forwarding is not possible without breaking our principles, as we discussed, due to pipeline design and instruction latencies. For example, the load word instruction does not finish reading data until the end of the memory stage, and its result cannot be forwarded to the execute stage of the next instruction from the pipeline register after it's latched. That's why after a load word, you have a bubble uh, and you need to fill that bubble somehow, somehow or you need to stall. Uh, you need to basically use any of the data dependence uh, handling techniques that we discussed, but you cannot use forwarding unless you, can, you want to pay the cost of lengthen the clock cycle quite a bit, basically. Okay, so this is our stalling, basically. Uh, this is basically what I said. You, you need to stall uh, and instruction and later instruction so that uh, they get the correct value. Okay, so let's talk about hardware needed for stalling a little bit more. Uh, as we already discussed, uh, this is already this is also a review, but basically stalls are supported by adding enable inputs to the fetch and decode pipeline registers and a synchronous reset or clear input to the execute pipeline register. Basically, all prior pipeline stages should be disabled. Later, uh, to, the, to the next stage, you need to insert a bubble, either by clearing the control signals to be always zero or an invalid associated with each pipeline register indicating that contents are invalid as we discussed. When a load word stall occurs, uh, uh, you need to stall, stall the decode and fetch stages, okay, so that they can hold their values. And you need to flush the execute stage such that you clear the contents of the execute pipeline register. That way you introduce a bubble or you make it invalid as we discussed earlier. And that's what your book does basically. The, so this definition, what I just, just discussed, your book doesn't have invalid bits. It basically clears the registers. As you can see, it has enable bits over here as we discussed. Uh, uh, well, enable inputs, and it also has clearing inputs over here. Okay, I, I don't want to spend more time on this because this is real implementation, and uh, I think you, you can already figure this out based on what we've discussed. Uh, so take a look at the implementation in your book and uh, have fun with it. As I said, at some point, this is going to be uh, things that you can easily do, uh, like bread and butter. It's, very, it's, it's relatively simple. Okay, let's talk about a special case of data dependence, which is control dependence. This is data dependence on the instruction pointer, program counter. We mentioned this last time. I'm going to go a little bit more into it right now. But basically, we have a fundamental question that we kind of ignored so far. What should the fetch PC program counter be in the next cycle? Answer is, of course, the next the address of the next instruction, right? But all instructions are control dependent on the previous ones. Why? Because all instructions increment the program counter, right? If the fetch instruction is a non-control flow instruction, it's not a problem, right? Next fetch PC is the address of the next sequential instruction. And this is easy to determine if we know the size of the fetched instruction. In MIPS, I say it's four. So you, you do PC equals PC plus four. And once you do it in the fetch stage, if you actually increment the PC in the fetch stage by uh, latching PC plus four into the PC, no problem. You're going sequential. The problem happens if the instruction that is fetched is a control flow instruction. Then how do you determine the next fetch PC? Well, you could guess. You could say that, oh, I'm going to guess that this instruction is going to be not taken uh, and keep uh, incrementing the PC until later I figure out that the instruction is going to be taken. And that's a perfectly valid way of approaching the problem. In fact, that's what we discussed. That's actually called 
branch prediction. You're basically predicting, uh, assuming something about what the branch will do. And if the branch does something else, then you're going to flush the pipeline, as we will see. But basically, we have an even bigger problem. In fact, how do you know whether or not the fetch instruction is a, con is a control flow instruction? We're going to handle this question later on when we talk about branch prediction in more detail. But right now, let me give you a very simple way of handling control dependencies. So basically, control dependencies are a special case of data dependence. They're dependence on the program count. But they're a very special case because they occur right in the beginning of the pipeline. Right? ALU stage is later in the pipeline. And clearly, not all instructions are dependent on each other in the, in the, uh, in the ALU stage. But branches, uh, you may have a lot of instructions dependent. They occur at the beginning of the pipeline. And they, have, they can have actually a lot of impact on performance, as we will see later. Remember the BEQ, branch equal? This branch is not resolved until the fourth stage of the pipeline in our pipeline design. We did talk about it briefly. Uh, I will show you more. But basically, instructions after the branch are fetched before the branch is resolved, assuming you keep incrementing the PC. So basically, we're always predicting that the next in in sequential instructions fetched. We're assuming implicitly that branch is always not taken when we fill the pipeline. But that's not always true, right? When BEQ executes, uh, we may figure out that the branch is supposed to be taken. But we've already fetched three instructions into the pipeline. Branch is done at the fourth stage. We've already fetched three instructions. What are we going to do with those three wrong instructions that we fetched? We were not supposed to fetch the next sequential instruction and the next sequential instruction after that and the next sequential instruction after that because the branch is taken, right? Clearly, this is happening because we are violating the von Neumann model at the microarchitecture level, right? If we were perfectly obeying the von Neumann model, which means that we were not, we're not supposed to be doing pipelining, then this won't happen and everything is beautiful. But we're violating the von Neumann model. We're basically uh, inserting instructions into the pipeline, fetching instructions into the pipeline before we know what's going on with the prior instruction, BEQ in this case. And we're doing something wrong at the early stages of the pipeline. So we need to correct that thing that we do wrong, meaning we shouldn't have fetched these instructions. Right? So basically, this is called a branch misprediction. This is called a branch misprediction. Basically, we've assumed something but that was not correct. We assumed that the branch is supposed to be not taken. So we fetched the next sequential instructions, but that was not correct because when the branch executed, we figured out, oh, the, the next instruction after the branch should have been the in instruction at the target address of the branch. Right? Now we've done something wrong. We need to correct it. And we don't report it anywhere, right? This is all happening in hardware. The software is not aware of it clearly. So it's perfectly fine. We're not violating anything in the instruction set architecture. But we need to make sure that we don't violate anything in the instructions of architecture. So to be able to do that, we need to handle this branch misprediction. So branch misprediction penalty refers to the number of instructions that are flushed when the branch is taken, meaning branch is mispredicted in this case. So this may be reduced by resolving the branch earlier also. We're going to talk about that right now, actually. So basically, if you look at the original pipeline, branch is resolved over here. Uh, this is cycle four. You fetch. You decode the access register file, you execute in the ALU, and then you resolve the branch over here. So resolution happens over here. Uh, it's one way of implementing it. You could also resolve it potentially over here, but then you could lengthen your critical path, et cetera. But basically, the logic is here, which means that the three, when, when the branch is over here, next sequential instructions here, next sequential instructions here, next sequential instructions here, when you figure out that the branch should not be taken, should not have been, should, uh, should, should have been taken, you need to flush all these instructions and redirect the program counter to the target address of the sober branch. This is our original pipeline. So basically, three instructions are flushed. That's what this is saying over here. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through this figure in detail. You can find in your book also. But I explained that the next three instructions need to be flushed because they're wrong. You shouldn't have fetched them. Then this is showing that. So can you reduce the number of instructions to be flushed, basically? That's one question. And one answer could be resolve the branch earlier. So branches are so important that we may want to resolve them, meaning execute them earlier. right? And this is one way of doing that. Instead of having, let's go back over here. Instead of executing the branch in the ALU, remember branch was equal to check. We check whether the source register is equal to destination register. And if that's the case, you basically uh, change the uh, program counter to the target address. And here we're latching the result of the ALU over here because we don't want to lengthen the critical path. The suggestion is, oh, we could actually do that in the uh, register after we access the register file. Source register one, source register two, we can have an equality checker, specialized BEQ execution logic. Of course, the problem is now you need to do it for all types of branches if you want to be general. 
So it's not, it's not just an equality checker, but this is, this is an equality checker just for the BEQ. And if the source and destination are equal, you basically take the target address from the target address calculation logic of the branch, which happens to be in this stage, okay? So that we can execute the jumps correct. So if we do this, this is good because when the branch is resolved, we have only one instruction that was fetched after the branch that's waiting in the fetch stage. So we cannot resolve the branch in the instruction memory because you haven't even read the instruction. You cannot resolve the branch in the fetch stage because you don't even know if it's a branch, right? You need to at least decode it. But you can resolve it over here after you read the register file with some penalty, which is this additional logic. But you fetch one instruction, you just need to flush that instruction, right? But that's beautiful. Now you reduce the branch misprediction penalty from three to one. So if you mispredicted this branch, meaning the branch was supposed to be taken, and you discovered that in the register file stage, only one instruction that you fetched is wrong, and you need to flush it. OK, so this is, uh, let's discuss the trade-offs of this a little bit, because the trade-offs are actually important for uh, multiple things over here. Uh, let me see. Also, if we write an immediate to the register file, we have to correct that too, right? So uh, I think this question uh, uh, it, it resolves the branch. So basically, uh, the assumption is that you never write to the register file until the instruction gets to the write back stage. Okay. So that assumption, don't change that assumption. If you change that assumption, all hell block breaks loose, basically. <laughs> okay. Uh, because we, we made that assumption uh, such that an instruction writes to the register file only uh, uh, at the write back stage. If you start writing to the register file earlier, yes, all kinds of problems happen and you should not do that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, early branch resolution, is that a good idea? Uh, the advantage is clearly, I've shown you, reduce branch misprediction penalty. You flush only one instruction as opposed to three, which means that you reduce the cycles per instruction, right? Clearly. Okay, so that's probably good. But remember, performance equation is not just about cycles per instruction. It's cycles per instruction times clock cycle time times the number of instructions. In this case, we're not changing the number of instructions because we're not changing the program. We're changing the cycles per instruction, hopefully reducing them. but the logic we add over here may increase your critical path, right? And you need to be careful about that. So clearly, we've added logic. It may potentially increase the clock cycle time. It may lead to higher clock period and lower frequency, which may offset some of the gains we get from reduced CPI. And we will see this more when we talk about branch prediction later on in a later lecture. But there's another disadvantage. Now we have additional hardware cost, right? We're adding this really specialized hardware logic that's likely not used by other instructions so that we can reduce the penalty that is introduced by the branches. So if you go back, this is the simplest logic, equality checker and some uh, and logic, as you can see. Normally, we were doing it in the ALU. Now we're adding actually this logic into specialized logic into the register file stage. And who else is going to use it? Probably not many instructions, right? So basically, this is going to increase our, this, is, this has increased our hardware cost clearly. And whenever you want to actually do this, resolve things early in the pipeline, you have to increase your hardware cost like this. And if you want to deal with all of the branches, which we will see later on, then you, this hardware cost actually may be really significant. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. But these are the uh, advantages and disadvantages. And also, on top of this, you actually may need to have the data forwarding paths, right? Uh, remember the data forwarding? Uh, we're not immune to that. Branches are not immune to that. Branch may be dependent on an instruction that's executing over here or here or here, potentially, right? Okay. Which means that the, the value that the branch reads from the register file may not be the correct value. You may need to get it from here or here or here, depending on the pipeline again, right? So basically, you need to really send all of the data forwarding paths to the branch uh, execution unit that we added early branch resolution unit, I should say, that we added into the register file stage, which may actually increase our critical path even more and hardware cost even more. So data forwarding is important. Or you could say, OK, I stole the branch. But then uh, you basically are back to square one. If you don't add this data, data forwarding path, and it's really common that uh, this branch needs data values that are coming from uh, an immediately earlier instruction then you basically added more stall cycles because branch is actually data dependent on an earlier instruction, right? Okay, uh, so there are multiple questions. Can we consider branches separately or is it too expensive? Well, we're kind of doing that here, but I, I, I think basically maybe what you're getting at is can we do even more special things about branches? And the answer is yes, actually. Uh, 
modern processors do a lot of special things about branches. And you will see that when we talk about branch prediction. And it's going to be a lot of fun when we talk about branch prediction. Uh, so if you don't write anything when we mispredict a branch, how does the specter vulnerability happen then? Basically, wait for now. Basically, it's a very simple pipeline right now. Uh, uh, we will see later on in out of order execution that a lot of instructions execute uh, even after a mispredicted branch uh, is in the pipeline. Right? But you don't, you, don't, you don't write the values into the register file, uh, but uh, we will also change that. You may write values into the register file, but those values may not be visible uh, to, uh, to the architectural state. OK, uh, so for Spectre, uh, you will need to wait until you learn about auto word execution, speculation, caches, et cetera. So that requires a lot more background. OK, so basically, we've expanded our forwarding and stalling hardware control logic, because now uh, we added branch stalls. We, ha we had load word stalls. And we, had we need to add uh, forwarding for uh, the branch logic as well uh, over here. So, Things are getting more complicated, as you can see, right? And I'm not going to go through this logic again. But this is our final pipeline misprocessor in Harris and Harris. Uh, so I've kind of finished uh, everything I wanted to say about this part of the pipeline. But you can see that it's already complicated. This data dependence checking logic is actually quite complicated, as you can see over here. And we have a lot of forwarding paths. And imagine making the pipeline deeper. That's going to be a problem. Imagine making the pipeline wider, meaning having more instructions per stage. And we will see that later on when we talk about super scale execution. All of them are going to complicate the machine, but existing machines are actually like that. And they're even more complicated, actually. OK, let me quickly foreshadow what we're going to talk about, and then we're going to take a break. Basically, uh, you can do better. You can be smarter, basically. And this goes along with your colleague. What uh, uh, They asked that, can we actually specialize more branches? And actually, yes, because branches are so important you may want to guess whether the branch will be taken or not. So backward branches are usually taken because you may have a loop that iterates a million times, for example, and that's a backward branch, and they're usually taken. So actually, predicting taken is a better idea than predicting not taken in general in programs, and we will talk about that. So you can consider the history of whether a branch was previously taken to improve the guess. You can, you can basically learn from past behavior of the branches or behavior of your program to do a better prediction. In fact, some modern processors use very simple machine learning techniques like perceptron-based uh, learning. We will discuss that when we talk about branch prediction very briefly. Some modern processors use very simple machine learning techniques to train how to predict the branches in a better way, in a dynamic manner, as the programs execute. And they also use other techniques also for memorization, et cetera. So modern processors actually uh, put a lot of effort into predicting the branches correctly or in a more smart or intelligent way. And good prediction require, it reduces the fraction of branches that are requiring a flush in the end. So OK, we're going to get back to this. Uh, but if you cannot wait, uh, you can watch some of the lectures that we have online in earlier incarnations of this course. Uh, in fact, I like the slide over here. We're going to cover the slide in a couple of weeks, not next week, after we talk about auto word execution. But this basically shows that if you have a 99% accuracy, even that's, that may not be good enough. You may still be fetching 20% extra instructions into the machine. Even if you're 90% accurate in your prediction, you may actually be doubling the instructions that you're fetching. And if you're interested, you can actually watch this lecture earlier. And we will also talk about some modern predictors that exist in uh, real machines. And uh, for more, uh, you can, the branch prediction can actually enable some code optimizations. But uh, we will not talk about code optimizations uh, later because we don't have enough time. OK, so this is a really good place to take a break. Uh, let's take a break uh, for 10 minutes. Let's be back at 15.24, according. Well, I guess 15.25 is OK, because my watch moved from 14 to 15 right now. Keep the questions coming. Uh, we will continue with a very quick performance example, which I'm not going to go into detail. But then we're going to go into concepts, uh, other concepts of handling data dependencies and control dependencies as well. So see you soon in 10 minutes. OK. Uh, now we're going to talk about a very quick example on pipeline performance. Uh, I'm going to defer the question uh, that was asked uh, to later because we're going to cover interrupts, hopefully, toward the end of this lecture. Uh, and we can talk about uh, the question at that point. Uh, let's talk about uh, pipeline performance very quickly. Uh, I'm going to give you one way of doing pipeline performance calculation. Sorry, I, I hear myself for some reason. OK. Uh, Basically, uh, we're going to do some calculation on pipeline performance very quickly, uh, just to give you an idea. I'll give you mainly the insights. But assume that uh, you're benchmarking the system, and there are people who benchmark real computing systems to figure out what kind of performance you get. Assume that uh, you have one workload uh, 
where the distribution of instructions looked like this, right? 25% lows, 10% stores, 11% branches, 2% jumps, 52% R-type instructions. And suppose that 40% of loads are used by the next instruction, meaning that immediately next instruction are, is dependent on the load for 40% of the loads, meaning that you need to have a stall after the load, right? For that case, and the compiler didn't do a good job uh, scheduling an independent instruction over there. And 25% of the branches are mispredicted. And all jumps flush the next instruction, regardless, basically, uh, because uh, there's no uh, essential all jumps are mispredicted in this case, because you always take the target address and uh, you have to flush what was fetched into the instruction fetch stage. And then the next question is, what is the average CPI? So if you're given a question like this, it's relatively easy to calculate at this point. Of course, you need to assume the pipeline structure that we discussed. But basically, each instruction has a cycle per instruction. Basically, we need to calculate what is the cycle per instruction that we get for loads, stores, branches, jumps, R-type, and then weight them with the frequency of occurrence of each of these instruction types. And we will essentially do that. But let's take a look at the so CPI of a store will be one, uh, because we're going to be finishing one store per instruct, uh, one, one, one store per cycle, right? Or we're going to be expanding one cycle per store because they're not going to cause data dependencies. They're not going to cause uh, these flushing. Uh, that's true for our type instructions also, right? They're not going to cause data dependencies. Well, they are, they cause data dependencies, but they're not going to cause stalls and they're going to call, uh, not going to cause flushing because we have data forwarding paths uh, to handle our type instructions, instruction uh, forwarding of data between our type instructions. The problems really happen with load to later instruction, next instruction forwarding, branches and jumps as we will see. So basically, uh, the load and branch cycle per instruction is one when there is no stall or flush, but we will have an additional cycle two when there is a stall or flush, right? Because essentially the instruction after the load cannot go, which means that the load, it, it looks as if the load is taking two cycles in this case. So basically we discussed that for 60% of the loads, there is no instruction that requires a value after it. So CPI is one times 0 0.6 plus two cycles times 40% of the time, because 40% of the time, the load takes two cycles effectively, right? So the CPI of the load is 1.4 in this case. CPI of branch can be calculated in a similar way. 75% of the time, uh, the branch, is, uh, branch doesn't cause any flush. It's uh, correctly predicted. As a result, uh, you finish one instruction per cycle, but 25% of the time you flush two instructions. So the branch really takes two. Uh, so this is really 1.25 as you can see. So the average CPI looks essentially like this. Uh, so you flush one instruction, I should say, not uh, two instructions, because you finish uh, the branch and then the next instruction is flushed. Okay, so basically the average CPI looks like this. For load, you have CPI 1.4 times 25% of the instructions uh, are loads. Plus, uh, for store, it's always one cycle times 10% of the instructions are sto uh, stores. For branches, we calculate the CPI 1.25 times 11% of the instructions are branches. For jumps, as we said, you always flush the next instruction. So it takes two cycles per instruction, but luckily we have only 2% of the instructions jumps. For our type instructions, we take one cycle and 52% of the instructions are our type. So we get 1.15. There's a question, where do we get the 75%, 60% values? That's what I assumed over here, basically. 40% uh, of the loads are used by next instruction. 25% of the branches are mispredicted. If you subtract that from 100%, you get 60% and 70%, 75% over here. So basically our average CPI is 1.15. Which, is, which doesn't sound too bad, right? It's not, uh, uh, it's close to one, uh, close enough to one in this case. But let's take a look at clock cycle time. And for this, I'm going to refer you to your book. So clearly you need to do the critical path analysis like we did, we've done in uh, the timing and verification lecture. I'm not going to go through that again. You need to figure out what is the critical path in the different pipeline stages. And essentially the operation uh, of the clock frequency uh, or clock period will depend on the longest stage, right? And in this case, it happens to be decode. So basically, decode, we need to read the register file and then uh, also uh, do an equality check for branch calculation. And there are a bunch of muxes that you need to go through. And then there's a setup time. Uh, and you need to do the, uh, do the read uh, twice. That's why there's a two in front of them, basically. Decode and write back use register file and have only half a clock cycle to complete, as we discussed. That was a design choice that we made which is probably a bad design choice, as you can see from, as you will see soon from here. But decode takes a very long time. So half of the clock cycle, you need to finish all of these operations, read the register file, uh, and then 
uh, do the equality check calculation for the branch, go through the muxes, do, go through the setup time, go through the end gate in half a clock cycle. That's why this is doubled because other half is used for uh, uh, they're reading the register file, uh, writing into the register file from the right back stage as we discussed earlier. So it, it turns out the equal stage is the critical path and that's a very bad critical path. In this case, it's about 550 picoseconds over here. So uh, I will argue that this is a bad design actually. This shows for, to you that this is just a, a design to uh, show uh, interesting things about a pipeline. If, if in a real system, decode stage is your critical path, then you have a problem because decode stage should almost never be on your critical path. Uh, in real systems, memory access stages, uh, like load uh, memory access uh, stage uh, we have in the pipeline or the fetch stage, it makes a lot of sense for them to become critical paths because memory access takes time. And also you need to do other things in those stages, not just memory access. Uh, so usually the critical path goes to the fetch stage or the memory access stage in general. Uh, if decode is your critical path, then you're probably doing something wrong in the design of your pipeline. And clearly I can point to you that we're doing something wrong in the design. In fact, there are two things that we're doing wrong. Uh, one is uh, we, we have only half a cycle to read the register file, go through the maxes, do the equality check, et cetera, right? Basically we're reducing our, uh, increasing our cycle time because we're writing to the register file in one cycle, reading from the register file in the other cycle. Maybe that's a bad assumption. We should revisit that potentially. The second thing that we're potentially doing wrong is this resolving this branch, doing this equality check in uh, after the register file reads. Maybe that's not a good idea, right? But that needs to be evaluated after you balance the pipeline in a better way, basically. But the key takeaway is decode should really not be your critical path in real designs. Uh, and I've, uh, I've seen many, many real designs and I can confidently say that you can always break down decode into multiple stages, but sometimes memory is much harder to break, break down into multiple stages. Okay, but that's, that's how it is. This is the design that we have, uh, that we have developed, that's in your book, 550 picoseconds. Let us take a look at uh, what happens to the performance of a program with 100 billion instructions executing on our pipeline processor. Remember the execution time equation? We have number of instructions times cycle per instruction times clock cycle time. We calculated CPI, we calculated uh, clock cycle time. And we are given 100 billion instructions. So this instruction, this uh, program with 100 billion instructions takes 62, 63 seconds. Now compare this to a single cycle and multi-cycle performance evaluation that your book does. We didn't go through this in detail. I have actually these in the backup slides. If you're interested, you can go through them, uh, but not really, really necessary. Uh, you can read your book. If you've re done the readings, you've seen this probably in your book, but basically your book show that the execution time in a single cycle processor is 95 seconds, multi-cycle processor is 133 seconds, which is also not good, I think. But uh, again, if we had time, we would have discussed why that is the case as we discussed with the pipeline. But let me compare the design of the single cycle versus pipeline. Basically, we're getting a speed up of only 1.5X, which is 50%. So fastest of the architectures that we developed, microarchitectures that we developed is pipeline microarchitecture, that's good. But Ideally, you would expect 5x performance improvement, right? Uh, if you have a five-stage pipeline. Remember the ideal pipeline that we talked about in the last lecture? Of course, we said we cannot achieve the ideal, but we're not even achieving five, uh, anywhere close to 5x in this case. We're achieving 50%, 1.5x, right? Not 5x. So basically, this points to the fact that pipeline is not efficient. And the problem is not just coming from the data dependencies, because if you look at CPI, cycles per instruction, it's very close to one, right? 1.15. The problem is really coming from how we balance the pipeline and how we actually uh, set the critical path of the pipeline. So really this decode stage is problematic over here. And uh, that's why we're not getting a lot of speed up over here. So if you see a result like this, then you ask the question, why am I not getting the performance that I'm supposed to be getting? And then you dig deeper, do some critical thinking exercise, and you figure out that you've done something wrong, right? And this is something that we should do as engineers, as scientists, as human beings, always introspect. Did I do something wrong here? And uh, I, can I already pinpointed you to the fact that the critical path is something that was done wrong to, for two reasons that we discussed uh, earlier. But of course you can dig deeper and make the performance even better, but we're not going to do that right now. And your paper doesn't do that also, but this is an instructive performance analysis example as you have seen. Okay. So now let's get back to the fundamentals a little bit more. We've actually looked at 
detecting, how to detect uh, dependencies. And we discussed detecting and stalling or waiting. We discussed detecting and forwarding and bypassing. And we discussed detecting and eliminating the dependence causing conditions by doing instruction scheduling, for example. There's another way, which is you detect uh, the stall causing condition and move the dependent instruction out of the way to some area hard in hardware and then get in independent instructions in the pipeline and execute them. This is called out of order execution. It's a very powerful concept. We're going to do it. Uh, we're going to examine it tomorrow. But keep in mind that that's another way of handling the data dependencies. OK, let's talk about the next way over here, which is predicting the need and value. We did not discuss this much. I'm not going to discuss this more. But we talk about uh, discuss this a lot also. But we talked about predicting the branches, right? If you have a data value, let's say you're sourcing register S0. And a later instruction, load instruction, is writing to S0. Instead of stalling, you may say, I'm going to predict the value of SCO, right? I'm going to guess SCO is going to be zero, for example, value zero or, or 10, value 10. If you do it intelligently and correctly, then there's no problem, right? Basically, you predict. If you need to stall, don't stall. You predict what the value should be. If you're correct and execute the instruction with that predicted value or guessed value, basically you're guess guessing or estimating. If you're correct, no problem. Basically, execute the instruction speculatively before you knew, know that the value is correct. That's essentially what we're doing with the fetch stages of the pipeline, right? Whenever we have a branch in the pipeline, we're guessing that the next instruction is the next sequential instruction. And if we're wrong, we're flushing the instructions. We're going to do exactly the same thing, but we're going to do value prediction as opposed to branch prediction. And the idea is whenever the value becomes available, you check whether your guess was correct. You compare the real value, correct value, to the, what your guess was. If they match, no problem. You don't need to do anything. If they don't match, well, too bad. You need to flush the pipeline, flush this instruction and all of the instructions after it. So this is called value prediction. It's not really employed uh, in the general sense in many processors because it complicates the pipeline even more. Uh, and you also need to uh, somehow uh, need to do the prediction, right? How do you do the prediction? It's a question. And there's a question, actually. How do we actually do this prediction? Do we use control unit? Well, you need to have a separate structure, uh, basically. You need to, uh, one way of doing the prediction is always predicting a value, right? Well, I'm always going to predict that the register is going to be zero. And in fact, actually, people have shown that that's not a terrible prediction because zero values are more common, much more common than many other values in real programs. But again, the accuracy of that prediction is not very high. It's about 30% or, or if you're really lucky, 40%. So if you're always predict that it's zero, then you don't need to do anything, right? Your prediction is, well, do anything uh, to, decide what to predict. But of course, uh, there are other sophisticated methods. You can, you can basically learn what values are used more commonly, for example, over time. You can keep a record of that in hardware somewhere. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, I will defer uh, the kind of answer to the branch prediction lectures, because branch prediction also requires these auxiliary structures that are needed to do the prediction accurately. But that's a very good question, basically. OK, now let's cover this, uh, do something else. But before that, I will give you some questions to ponder. I'm not going to go through detail. Maybe we will cover these questions to ponder later on as well. But uh, what is the role of hardware versus software in data dependence handling? This is a very fundamental uh, question. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real architectural question. It's a real trade-off question. It's also uh, a, a philosophy question as well. Basically, should the software do the data dependence handling, or should the hardware do it? Who should insert and manage the pipeline bubbles? Who finds the independent instructions to fill the empty pipeline slots? Or do you insert no ops? Or do you just stall? Right. What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Basically, you need to think of the performance equation as well over here. I'm not going to go through the details. I've given you certainly some examples where the software can insert no ops, software can reorder instructions. Certainly, that complicates the software now, right? Uh, but it simplifies the hardware. Whereas if the hardware uh, does the stalling, et cetera, that complicates the hardware. But now the software is off the hook, if you will. Uh, the compiler can reorder the instructions as it wants. The pipeline will just work perfectly correctly, regardless of what the compiler or the programmer throws at the pipeline, right? Uh, pipeline will not do something wrong, basically, because we implemented hardware-based interlocking and data dependence handling, managing the pipeline correctly. In that case, the software uh, is off the hook, if you will. Usually in modern systems, it's a combination of both, actually. In modern systems, if you want to get the best performance, 
Today, you do out-of-order execution hardware, which we will see. Basically, hardware finds the independent instructions to fill the empty pipeline slots, as we will see tomorrow. Hardware does the stalling, et cetera. But if the software is smart enough, it can schedule the instructions nicely. The hardware uh, and software work together in a way that maximizes the performance. But of course, this complicates both now, right? If both software and hardware are doing things such that they can maximize the performance, they're both complicated. Plus, uh, uh, not only that they're, they're, they're both complicated, uh, but, uh, but they may sometimes be going against each other also. Uh, like you can some, sometimes question whether the software is not necessarily going against each other, but they may be inefficient. They may, they may be repeating themselves. So software is doing some instruction scheduling. Hardware is also doing some instruction scheduling, as we will see, stalling, et cetera. But uh, they're, uh, they're not efficient because they're both doing the same thing at different uh, levels, if you will. So keep these in mind uh, when you're thinking uh, about hardware versus software. And this is really at the core of uh, the course. This is really a core course about hardware and software, as I discussed in lecture one. And thinking about these questions is going to be very important as we go forward also. OK, uh, basically, what is the role of the hardware versus the software in, in the order in which instructions are executed in the pipeline? That's the next question, basically. Uh, and this leads us to either software-based instruction scheduling, this is also called static scheduling, or hardware-based instruction scheduling, which is also called dynamic scheduling. So st static scheduling is anything that happens before the execution of the program is considered static. Anything that happens during the execution of the program is considered dynamic. Dynamic is al also means runtime, basically. Static means before runtime, let's say. It could be compile time. Right? So uh, how, do, how does each impact different metrics? We've already seen an example where the software inserted no ops, right? Or we ordered the instructions. Clearly, there are very, very interesting things to examine here, which we don't have time to go into detail. What is the effect on performance and parts of the performance equation? Because if hardware does data forwarding, for example, clearly that affects the cycle time, that affects the hardware cost and complexity, that affects the power consumption, that potentially affects the reliability, et cetera. Basically, uh, there are two really uh, completely diverging approaches to this. Uh, MIPS, for example, was developed with static scheduling in mind. Basically, people said hardware should be as simple as possible. Software will, is going to handle everything, including the correctness of the pipeline. The microprocessor with, with, will have non-interlocking pipeline stages without interlocking pipeline stages. That's an extreme. Dynamic scheduling says software doesn't do anything. I'm going to execute, hopefully, everything in the best order as possible. It's kind of like data flow. But of course, it's also an extreme because this complicates hardware a lot. And you may not be able to actually do uh, that execution really, really nicely because you need to find out which instructions are independent, et cetera, as we will see tomorrow. But basically, these two extremes, only static scheduling and only dynamic scheduling, are usually not the best in all metrics. So usually, you really need a combination, software and hardware cooperation, basically. And we will see some examples of that software-hardware cooperation going forward uh, as well. OK. So one last slide on software versus hardware. If you do software-based scheduling of instructions, it's called static scheduling, as I said, before runtime scheduling. Compilers order, compiler orders the instructions or reorders the instructions. Hardware executes them in that order because we're still obeying the von Neumann model. Contrast this with dynamic scheduling, in which the hardware can execute instructions out of the compiler specified order. We will see that tomorrow. But if you do the software-based scheduling, the compiler needs to know a lot. And it may not always know everything because some things happen dynamically, right? You may not know the latency of an instruction, and we will discuss why in a little bit. The, the question is, how does the compiler know the latency of each instruction? So if the latency of the instruction is static, meaning it doesn't depend on runtime factors, this is not a problem. This is great. The compiler can be given that information, right? Based on the pipeline design, uh, that information can be exposed. But there are some information types that compiler cannot know that makes static scheduling and reordering of the instructions difficult. Basically, determining how many instructions should you order, uh, should, you, should you put after this load becomes difficult. And I'm going to give you these very quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but you will discuss uh, later. But basically, the answer is anything that is determined at runtime, any latency that is determined at runtime affects st static scheduling. If the, the compiler cannot know this, right? So this could be variable length operation latency. Uh, what does this mean? Let me give you an example. You may have a multiply instruction. That multiply instruction sometimes takes one cycle, sometimes takes 16 cycles. Why? Because you may know that you're multiplying with zero at the beginning. And you may have a shortcut in hardware saying that if, I if one of my operands is zero, 
I'm going to give you the result right away because I'm not going to do the multiplication because I know that if I multiply anything by zero, I'm going to get zero, right? So the result is zero. Here, after one cycle, I detect the operand, one of the operands to be zero, and your result is zero. But if, the, if neither of the operands is zero, then you have to do the full multiplication, let's say 16 cycles, then it takes 16 cycles. So clearly, the, this information, whether the register value is, was zero, is not available to the compiler at runtime, uh, at, at, uh, at scheduling time, right? At, at before runtime. This is available to the hardware, though. That's why the hardware can do scheduling better than the compiler sometimes. OK, branch direction is another thing, right? We fetch this branch. The compiler doesn't know whether the branch is going to be uh, taken or not taken, right? It happens at runtime. So this makes scheduling difficult, as I discussed earlier, because compiler may want to reorder instructions before the branch or after the branch, et cetera. But it doesn't know which direction the branch will go. So the compiler needs to be conservative in the ordering. And it needs to make sure that everything works correctly. So it may need to increase the code uh, size, et cetera, as we will very briefly see later on. So this is something else that the compiler doesn't know. And the last thing the compiler doesn't know is the memory address. So whenever you're uh, calculating the address of a load or store instruction, that happens dynamically, right? Well, uh, at least uh, uh, if, if, depending on the addressing mode, of course. If the addressing mode is register plus offset and the register value is dynamically determined, then the compiler doesn't know the address. Basically, any value or late, uh, and dependent latency that's determined at runtime, compiler doesn't have access to. As a result, the compiler may not know how many instructions should it insert instead of no ops, or how many no ops to insert even. It has to be conservative. And the compiler may not know where, how to reorder the instructions because it may not know the branch direction and the memory address. So this makes static scheduling very, very difficult. But despite this, there have been a lot of techniques that were developed to make static scheduling. And many compilers today actually incorporate very, very sophisticated static scheduling mechanisms, which we're not going to talk about, unfortunately. So basically, one question is, how can the compiler alleviate this, estimate the unknown? So it's not as bad as I said, because the compiler can run the program, right? Uh, somebody can supply, let's say, representative input sets to the program. The compiler can run your program and say, oh, I figured out this branch is 99% taken. So I'm going to assume that it's mostly taken, and then schedule the code according to that frequently taken path, let's say. Right? This is called profile. The compiler essentially can profile the code with many different input sets and essentially uh, increase, uh, 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 essentially get some evidence as to uh, this information. Uh, the operation latency, memory addresses, uh, and branch direction by profiling the program. But again, that's not easy because you're, if your profiling set is not representative, if the profiling provides you not correct information, if the profiling run is different from the real execution of the program, then the compiler actually may do harm because it may actually increase the execution time because it relied too much on the profiling information. OK, I'm not going to talk more about this, but this is something that I thought at least you should know in terms of what profiling is and what the compiler can use it for. But today, there are actually compilers that do profile-driven optimizations uh, to, to overcome the lack of information that they have about runtime events. They run the program with some inputs, and they basically guess how the program should behave. And based on that guess, they schedule the instructions. If the program behaves according to that guess, that's great. The compiler did a great job. If the program does not behave according to that guess, it, the, the program actually contradicts that guess then maybe your code that was compiled with a profile during compiler actually doesn't execute as good in terms of performance. OK, but if, of course, if the compiler is required to provide correctness, then it should use profiling to improve performance, but it should ensure that correctness is not uh, uh, compromised, if you will. OK, so there's a lot over here. And this goes into the static instruction scheduling, which we're not going to cover. Uh, you, if you're really interested in this, you sh I would really recommend that you take a compiler's course, for example. This, these are fascinating topics, clearly. How can the compiler schedule instructions, make sure things are uh, good, et cetera? Uh, basically, I would recommend you uh, look at some earlier lectures, as you can see over here, on static instruction scheduling. There are a lot of really, really interesting ideas here that I'm not going to cover uh, in this class. OK, so let's talk about the last approach over here, which is do something else which is going to be a fascinating approach. I'm going to not spend a lot of time over here. I'm going to give you the basic idea. And this is called fine-grained multi-threading, essentially. So this is going to be a completely different approach uh, to handling flow dependencies. In fact, both control and data dependencies. And the idea is, well, expensive in terms of hardware, but uh, conceptually very simple. 
basically, hardware has multiple thread contexts, execution contexts, program counter plus registers. So it can execute multiple threads at the same time concurrently in hardware. So imagine we had program counter, right? We're not going to have one. We're going to have eight of them. Imagine we had a register file. We're not going to have one. We have eight of them. And in each set of PC plus registers, we're going to execute from a different thread. Uh, we're, we're going to have a different software thread, if you will. Each cycle, the fetch engine will fetch from a different thread. So the pipeline will still be simple. But in each cycle, we're going to fetch from a different thread. By the time the fetched branch or instruction resolves, no instruction is fetched from the same thread. Basically, we're going to execute an instruction from this thread. And we're not going to fetch any instruction until we are sure that there are no control or data dependencies okay, for the next instruction that we fetch. In the meantime, we're going to fill the pipeline with instructions from different threads. So this picture shows it, for example. You have, uh, you're basically fetching from stream three uh, while stream two, stream is basically instruction stream. Uh, these are different threads. While stream two is fetching its operands, while stream one is in the execution phase, while stream eight is also in the execution phase, while stream four is storing its result in the pipeline. Basically, the pipeline is full with instructions from different threads, different instruction streams. By definition, there are no two instructions in the machine that are dependent on each other, assuming these threads don't have dependencies with each other. Right? Basically, there are no register dependencies. There are no control dependencies. So essentially, what happens is branch and instruction resolution latency is overlapped with execution of other threads instructions. Okay, So you're overlapping this latency. So the good thing is there is no logic needed for handling control and data dependency within a thread. Everything that we discussed, we don't need it. Because we don't need to check for control dependence. We don't need to do branch prediction. We don't need to check for data dependence. We don't need to do any forwarding because there is no need. We're not fetching from the same thread until the instructions, data value, and the control dependence are all resolved. But of course, the downside is you're not using the pipeline for that single thread now. The single thread performance suffers because you're fetching from this thread every n cycles, if you will. And you need to have extra logic for keeping thread context. So program counter doesn't come for free. Register files don't come for free. I'm going to show you examples of that context. So hardware cost is high. You need to have multiplexers to decide which program counter and which registers to use, of course. And also the downside is it doesn't overlap the latency if not enough threads uh, exist to cover the whole pipeline. So if your pipeline is, let's say, 30 cycles, and if you have only 10 threads, well, you're not going to be able to fill your pipeline if you're fetching from one thread every other si every cycle, basically. OK, so I've given you the basic idea and I talked about some high-level trade-offs. Now, let's go into a little bit more detail here. So basically, the idea of fine-grained multi-threading, and this is fine-grained multi-threading. There are also coarser-grained forms of multi-threading. For example, Intel uh, and many other processor companies today use something called hyper-threading. It's called simultaneous multi-threading. It's a different form of multi-threading, uh, which we will not discuss right now. There's also a coarser gain forms of multi-threading where you switch on an event, for example, which we're not going to discuss. But here, we're very regular. We switch to another thread every cycle such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently. Okay, that's the idea. This tolerates the control and data dependence latencies by overlapping the latency with useful work from other threads. So other should be uh, important here. This improves the pipeline utilization throughput by taking advantage of multiple threads. And this was actually introduced in the 1960s uh, in one of the fastest processors of its time, Control Data 6600 machines, and more popularized later by Burton Smith's uh, paper over here, which I'm going to briefly discuss also. But basically, uh, there was a peripheral processing unit uh, that was fine-grained multi-threaded in CDC 6600. I'm going to very quickly tell you why they did it. You, they had a, essentially a, a processor. Uh, they, they were able to execute a different I.O. thread every cycle. This is essentially a memory access thread. And a memory access took about 10 cycles. So they were able to have a pipeline where they would have 10 threads accessing the memory. And each thread will be sent to the pipeline every cycle. And you would have 10 threads uh, uh, get, uh, getting into the pipeline so that they could overlap the memory latency in this case. Later, it was more generalized. So this processor, for example, heterogeneous element processor had 120 threads per processor. That's a lot, as you can imagine. But this is not nothing compared to what we have in GPUs today. For example, I will discuss actually GPUs use exactly this idea of fine-grained multi-threading. Uh, Basically, it had an available queue and available, unavailable queue for threads that are waiting. 
each thread can have only one instruction in the processor pipeline. Each thread is independent from uh, different threads in this case. And to each thread, processor looks like a non-pipeline machine. And this is a very good uh, analogy. Basically, you're, ex you're fetching one instruction per thread into the pipeline. But from the perspective of each thread, there's no pipeline. The pipeline doesn't exist because you're fetching one instruction every n cycles, right? Because there's no two instructions from the thread that is in the pipeline at the same time, right? And as a result, you don't have any problem uh, with the issues that we discussed that arise because of pipeline. Control dependencies, data dependencies, no problem within a thread. Okay, so of course, it's like there's a clear trade-off here, right? We're, we're prioritizing system throughput over single thread performance. So pipelining clearly improves single thread performance, right? Because it's really improving instruction per cycle throughput or reducing cycles per instruction. We're not getting that benefit of pipelining in this case, but we're using the pipeline to process multiple threads at the same time concurrently. So we're getting the benefit in a different way as in terms of system throughput. So if you have many threads to execute, this is great. You don't care about single thread performance, that's great. So you need to, uh, two conditions need to hold true. You should have many threads to execute to keep the pipeline full, such that you get, you get the throughput benefits. And you should not really care much about your single thread performance so that you don't get penalized because you're not getting the latency benefits uh, or, or, or uh, execution time benefits, I should say, uh, for a single thread in a pipeline. OK, so let me give you this example. Uh, basically, this is a fine grained multi-threading in the heterogeneous element processor. Uh, it happened that at the time, uh, this processor had 100 nanosecond cycle time. It sounds ridiculous right now, as you can see. But basically, that eight-stage pipeline. So an instruction took 800 nanoseconds to complete, assuming no memory access, of course. As a result, uh, because they had fine-grained multi-threading, there was no need for control and data dependence checking. Uh, and as a result, the pipeline was very simple. So this was a really, really simple pipeline, except uh, and this was developed by Burton Smith, who was actually my mentor at Microsoft Research. I was at Microsoft Research. I started the computer architecture group in 2006, and I was there for three years before I went back to academia at Carnegie Mellon. And we, uh, we actually did a lot of work together with Burton Smith, and uh, we talked a lot about uh, this also uh, in addition to networks. But uh, the credit actually goes to him in terms of influencing the modern GPUs, in my opinion, as well, because this pipeline... Uh, that is depicted over here, not depicted as a pipeline, as you can see, but you can see kind of patch operands, perform functions, store result, and then register memory access, etc. It's not exactly like a pipeline, but threads actually travel inside this pipeline. Uh, when one thread is fetching operands, another thread is actually uh, performing some function. Another thread can be performing some other function. If a thread requires memory access, it gets enqueued to a memory access queue. So there's somewhere else in the pipeline that it goes to, basically. It's different from the pipeline that we have seen. It's more similar to the GPU kind of pipelines, actually, uh, that we will see uh, later on. Uh, but keep this in mind. Essentially, it's a beautiful, very simple pipeline because there's no need for control and data dependence checking in this pipeline. So that's something that you should really take away from fine-grained multi-threading. Now let me go into what it looks like in a pipeline processor, not heterogeneous element processor. Heterogeneous element processor actually looks more like a GPU uh, today, actually. For example, a GPU today, when a thread needs to access memory, because memory access takes, let's say, 500 cycles, it gets taken out of the pipeline. And some other thread goes into the pipeline, basically. You keep the pipeline busy with many threads because uh, this is a GPU, right? Uh, the assumption is that graphics has a lot of threads that you can execute. You have, let's say, uh, 1 million pixels in an image. You can have one thread for each pixel. I just made it up. That's 1 million threads, right? That's a lot. If you want to be coarser grain, you can have 250,000 threads. That's a lot of threads. While Hundred of them are waiting for memory. You may have eight others that are in your pipeline, right? And that's the idea basically over here. Okay, so if you want to look at the idea from the pipeline perspective that we looked at earlier, this looks more like a pipeline that we've seen kind of, okay? But basically what we're doing is we're adding more program counters and more general purpose registers. So instead of having one program counter fetch from, we have four. In this case, we have four way multi-thread. We can accommodate four threads. And we have four register files. And of course, depending on which thread you're fetching from, you use the right register file, right? So basically, you need to select the thread. So each cycle, you choose a different thread to fetch from. So this is a very simple logic that basically keeps incrementing in a wrapping around manner the which thread you're going to fetch from. Every cycle, you fetch from a different thread. 
And whenever the thread needs to access the register file, you need to actually access your own register file, not someone else's register file, of course. And you need to provide the hardware paths and the multiplexers to be able to do that. So the pipeline becomes complicated, as you can see, right? Because you have more hardware. You have more hardware for MUXs. You have more hardware for thread selection. But there is no data dependency or branch prediction logic. So basically, there's a trade-off. OK, this was implemented also in Sun Niagara. This is one of the earliest uh, multi-core processors, actually. Uh, together with IBM, concurrently with IBM, Sun uh, was implementing multi-core processors. IBM was implementing a complicated multi-core processor, out-of-order processor. Sun decided, oh, we're going to make the pipeline really simple. And we're going to add fine-grained multi-threading so that we don't need to detect dependencies and we don't need to uh, do branch prediction. Later, they decided this was a bad idea because they had uh, single thread, uh, single thread uh, performance was important to them. But I'm not going to go into the details of it. But you can see that. Uh, essentially, they, uh, they had four threads uh, to cover four pipeline stages. Actually, they had five, uh, six pipeline stages, but uh, the, the late latter two pipeline stages were not really needed uh, because the instructions, control, and data dependencies were all resolved uh, at the end of the fourth pipeline stage. So basically, they only needed four threads to cover all the control and data dependence latencies. So you can see that uh, the fetch engine, PC logic over here, oh, yeah, there you go, has four different PCs. And then you need to select the thread, which thread to select from. And the thread select logic was a little bit complicated. I'm not going to go into details. You can read this paper if you're really interested. But basic idea is you can fetch from different threads every cycle. Sometimes you may not be able to fetch from that thread because that thread is taking an interrupt, as we will try to discuss, not today anymore, but probably tomorrow. Uh, and depending on the instruction type also, they did something different. But in the common case, they would fetch from one thread every cycle, one different thread every cycle. And then they would uh, buffer the instructions. They had four different instruction buffers, as you can see. They would select from there also. I'm not going to go into details of it. But you can see that, uh, uh, yeah, you can see that they also had four register files uh, and four store buffers, which we will discuss later on. I'm not going to talk about store buffers right now. But uh, this is to make sure that the threads actually store. Uh, if store takes a long time, the pipeline keeps going, basically. OK. So let me talk about fine-grained multi-threading advantages and disadvantages a little bit. And then I will very briefly introduce how it's used in GPUs, and then we're going to conclude. So basically, the huge advantage of this fine-grained multi-threading, fetching from one thread every cycle, and ensuring that there is no two instructions from the same thread in the pipeline is there's no need for dependence checking between instructions of a single thread. Only one instruction in the pipeline from a single thread, basically. No need for branch prediction logic. Control dependence problem goes away. And otherwise, bubble cycles or stall cycles or flush cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. So as a result, you get improved system throughput, latency tolerance, and pipeline utilization. Right? Of course, like every idea, we have disadvantages. right? So clearly, branch prediction also has advantages and disadvantages. So we can do this analysis for every single idea that we examine so far that we're going to examine in the future. Fine-grained multi-threading is no different. So basically, you add extra hardware complexity. You know, multiple hardware contexts, program counters, register files, and maybe more thread selection logic, as we have seen, multiplexers. Basically, you need to keep multiple architectural states inside the uh, pipeline for different threads, plus thread selection logic, et cetera, to ensure the control of the pipeline such that you get one instruction from uh, the different thread every cycle. Right? So you could argue, is this hardware complexity higher than the hardware complex for dependency checking? Well, the answer is it depends. A lot of the answers are it depends in this course. It really depends on what kind of pipeline you have. How many threads are you support? Are you thinking of supporting in fine-grained multi-threading? Uh, how many stages do you, are you supposed to have in your pipeline, et cetera, et cetera? So it, it's not an easy equation to uh, have a blanket answer for. It's really it depends. The big disadvantage, as, uh, in addition to the hardware complexity, is you get reduced single thread performance. So you're basically fetching one instruction from uh, the same thread every n cycles. And n is dependent on how you design your pipeline, clearly. But in, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in the heterogeneous element processor, n was 8. right? In modern GPUs, sometimes n is 6 or 8 also, potentially. In Niagara, n was uh, 4. Uh, some Niagara, n was 4. Uh, so it depends, basically. Uh, but basically, you're not using the pipeline to improve single thread performance. You're, you're missing an opportunity. And this may not be tolerable, right? Because there's, there are cases where you really care about the performance of a single thread. You don't care about the throughput of all threads. So for example, when I'm interacting with my cell phone, there is one thread that is potentially handling 
uh, my real-time interaction with the cell phone. I don't care if some other thread is executing the pipeline when I really need a response time from that particular thread that's responding to me, right? So in those cases, this may not be a good idea in terms of getting the best performance. Right? And of course, the uh, another disadvantage is resource contention between threads and caches and memory. We're not going to, we, if you remember the memory performance attacks uh, that we discussed earlier uh, to motivate a lot of things, uh, uh, computer architecture, for example, uh, interesting things in computer architecture. That happens a lot in a fine-grade multi-threaded machine. Basically, different threads may try to access memory. Different threads may try to access uh, different memory resources, and they contend with each other. And as a result, you may actually get into unfairness issues like we discussed very early in this course. Some dependency checking between threads remains. We're not going to talk about that, but if threads are actually dependent on each other, loads and stores, if they're sharing memory, for example, uh, that actually leads to uh, potentially sophisticated hardware, even in a fine-grained multi-threaded machine. And GPUs actually suffer from this potentially. If, for example, two threads in a GPU that you're executing are supposed to synchronize with a memory operation, they need to share memory. You need to be very careful about that. You need to actually use different constructs for that. And if those constructs are not supported by hardware nicely in your GPU, you may lose performance a lot. So this dependency checking within a thread goes away. But dependency checking between threads, which may be required for synchronization purposes across threads, for example, it actually leads to a problem, basically. So OK, there's one question that I will handle before I uh, conclude. Couldn't a compiler also make use of the hardware built-in capability to execute in, uh, different instruction threads in a round-robin manner? Even single-thread performance significantly increases. Well, I think uh, uh, potentially, yes, but uh, that's not a pure fine-grained multi-thread machine anymore. That's a fine-grained multi-thread machine that relies on a compiler uh, to do the right thing, basically. But yes, potentially, you could combine this idea, fine-grained multi-threading, with compiler-based instruction scheduling, and the compiler can instruct the hardware engine to not fetch from a different thread uh, because it has ordered the instructions such that you will not run into control and data dependence problems. Now you're getting into combining different ideas, which is a good idea, absolutely. And in the end, some of these are ideas that are actually combined in GPUs also. GPUs, for example, use fine-grained multi-threading plus something called very long instruction word, which is compiler-based scheduling of the instructions. Uh, so certainly you can do that, yes. But that is not something that I would consider a pure fine-grained multi-thread machine. It's a combination of multiple ideas, yes. OK, so let me conclude with this very quick, uh, fun part of the lecture, which is showing that modern GPUs are actually fine-grained multi-thread machines. We're going to talk about GPUs later in a later lecture, lecture 20 or so. And you're going to see this more. But I think it's good to uh, see this earlier also. But basically, it's an older GPU core, if you will. Uh, you can see that there are data parallel functional units, SIMD, we're going to see also, single instruction, multiple data, uh, and control. But uh, there's instruction stream decode and execution context storage. But basically, there are 64 kilobytes of storage for thread context. So you can actually execute many thread contexts within a GPU. So many threads exist. And you can actually have uh, different threads in the pipeline of a GPU. So if the pipeline is, let's say, eight cycles, you can have eight threads uh, in, in the pipeline of a GPU. So let, let's, get, let's look at one example. So there are groups of 32 threads that share an instruction stream. Each thread is called, uh, group is called a warp. We're going to see this in more detail later on. But basically, a warp in a GPU executes the same instruction on different data. This is, that's what single instruction multiple data means. But the way GPUs do pipelining is they basically interleave up to 32 warps in a fine-grained multi-thread manner. They may have an eight-stage pipeline, but they have 32 threads waiting for the pipeline. Essentially, if some uh, threads stall, they can keep feeding threads into the pipeline, essentially, uh, that, do not, that have not stalled due to memory. Okay, So you need to still handle the memory stalls. right? That's a different thing uh, than dependencies, control and data dependencies. If a thread needs to access memory and memory access take 500 cycles, then that needs to be taken out, uh, as we have discussed. But we will discuss this more in the GPUs, uh, plus later when we talk about caches, et cetera. But the key takeaway over here is that GPUs fundamentally are fine-grained multi-thread machines. They interleave groups of 32 threads in a fine-grained multi-threaded manner so that they can keep the pipeline very simple. They don't need branch prediction. They don't need data dependency detection within a thread. And if you look at an, uh, an older GPU, they have 30 cores, and they have 30,720 threads, as you can see over here. Essentially, uh, in each core, 
uh, you have 1,024 threads. And the goal is essentially to tolerate memory latency. If, and also keep the pipeline simple. There are two goals. Keep the pipeline simple, tolerate memory latency, and they achieve both goals with fine-grained multi-thread. OK, so if you are very interested, uh, this is a reading that I would recommend, which actually introduces multiple concepts. It introduces concepts of full empty bit synchronization uh, in uh, uh, parallel programming and parallel processing. But it also introduces the concept of, uh, well, at least reinforces the concept of fine-grained multi-threading as we know it today. Uh, it also talks about really interesting things like uh, designing networks, interconnection networks between different processors uh, in a, in a non-blocking manner, but I'm not going to go through that. And uh, Burton Smith and his colleagues actually designed the Terra computer system, uh, which, uh, which formed the blueprint of some of the future, uh, for some of the later uh, supercomputers designed by Cray. Some of you may know the uh, supercomputing company Cray. Uh, in fact, there's a Cray uh, machine uh, at the E floor uh, of uh, the cab building. If you go to cab building these days, there's a yellow Cray machine uh, that is essentially uh, influenced by the ideas from Terra, if you will. And if you're interested, you can also do this reading. But again, that's only if you're interested. These are not required. But uh, if you have time, maybe a bedtime reading, right? OK, so that brings me to uh, some uh, precise exceptions in pipelining, but we don't have time to cover it. So we're going to stop it here. If there is any question, burning question, I will handle it. Otherwise, tomorrow we will hopefully pick up from this precise exceptions and then go into out of order execution. Any questions? OK, I don't seem to hear anything. So we're going to stop here. Uh, and we're going to continue tomorrow. Take care. Have a good Friday, uh, Thursday evening.